Record. Hi everyone, I'd like to thank everybody who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, which is on the end user technology radar for September 2020 on observability. I'm Cheryl Hong, I'm the VP of Ecosystem at the CNCF, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And we'd like to welcome our presenters today, Kunal Palmer, who is Director of Software Development at Box, Martin Suterski, who is Software Architect at The New York Times, Jason Tarasovich, who is Principal Engineer at payitgov.com, and John Motor, who is Senior Principal Engineer at Zendesk. A few housekeeping items before we get started. So during the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee, but there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or to questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Uh, basically, just be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I'm going to kick off today's presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So as I've already said, today's webinar is going to be about the end user technology radar. So I'm Cheryl. Basically, I work with end users. So end users are companies who are not selling any cloud native products or services, but helping them get active and involved with the open source community and get engaged with meeting each other. Uh, this is the people I mean by the CNCF end user community. So there's more than 140 companies. They span finance and retail and software and so many other things. And all of these companies are using Kubernetes and other cloud native projects. So today I'm really happy to have with me some representatives from the end user community. And I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves one by one. So first off, we have John. Go ahead. Hi, I'm John Motor. I'm a senior principal engineer at Zendesk. Uh, I work in the, it's called the foundation organization or foundation engineering organization in Zendesk. We provide compute, storage, infrastructure, all the uh, technologies and tools needed for the rest of the Zendesk engineering org to deploy and run their, applica their applications. I've been working with Kubernetes and cloud native technologies for probably about five years now, right around the time that Kubernetes first came out. And I've been part of the CNCF end user group for, I don't know, probably three years now, I think. Um, so yeah, nice to meet you. Cool, thank you, John. Next up, Kunal. Hey, everyone. My name is Kunal. Um, I'm a director at Box. Uh, I'm in the backend organization where, uh, you know, I, my team is responsible for um, the platform that the rest of the engineering team uses to run all of our applications on. And so, you know, uh, we are responsible for everything from Kubernetes to service mesh to observability. Um, Box and, and myself have been involved with uh, um, the CNCF and the tools in this space as well from the very beginning. Uh, you know, we were very early adopters of Kubernetes. Um, and also we've been very, uh, we've been part of the CNCF end user community, I think from the very beginning as well. So I've been involved in all the end user meetings and everything. So nice to meet everyone here. Cool, thank you. Martin, you're up. Okay, my name is Maciej Sutecki. Uh, I'm a lead engineer of the New York Times. Uh, I work on a team called Deliver Engineering. Uh, we are essentially trying to enable other development teams and engineering teams at the organization to do whatever they need to get done for the business. Uh, so we're providing them with tools, different processes, uh, and a lot of education. Uh, and my focus currently on the team is observability. Fantastic. And Jason. 
Hello, I'm Jason. Um, so uh, I uh, started the platform engineering organization at Payit and up until recently led that team. And we were responsible for uh, our Kubernetes infrastructure, which we um, managed ourselves. We ran uh, run in AWS's GovCloud. Um, so there was no, no, no EKS until very, very recently. Um, and we, you know, provide the, the platform for our engineering teams um, to be able to deliver um, our solution to our government uh, partners. Awesome. Um, I want to thank all four of you for joining me today and for working with me on this radar to represent the whole of the CNCF end user community. So we're going to launch into the radar itself. So uh, technology radar is an opinionated guide to a set of emerging technologies. So this is the second time that we've run the CNCF end user technology radar, where we survey the different companies in the end user community and ask them to report what solutions they're using and whether they would recommend them to other people effectively. So there's three levels that we have. One is adopt, meaning we clearly recommend it. We've used it for a long time. It's stable. Secondly is trial, which is we've used it with some success. So we can recommend it, but maybe it's only applicable for certain use cases or we only use it in certain ways. And then the third, the third level is called assess. So assess is we've tried it out. We think it's promising and we recommend that you take a look at it. And then each technology radar is accompanied by some themes, which is anything that the radar team thought was interesting or unexpected or noteworthy about what they saw. So as a reminder, this is the second time we've done it. The first time was on continuous delivery, which was in June. So we're going to keep publishing these once per quarter. So first question. So obviously it's from the title, you know already that we chose observability for this radar. Um, Martian, maybe you can lead us off. Why, did, why do you find observability interesting? Um, I think it's really difficult to run any business or an organization without knowing how it's doing and having an insight into the processes, the products and engagement with users, for example, uh, is essential to be successful. And given that we are all running systems and providing features and uh, products to users, uh, it's important for us to provide them in a reliable way and understand how, how we're doing. Um, and as you know, the landscape, uh, including CNCF uh, products, uh, sort of exploded recently. There is many, many things to look at and be uh, interested in. Uh, so, you know, starting with metrics, logs, traces, there is many things to, uh, to analyze, to collect, and to measure. Uh, and there is also many different things encapsulated in the observability uh, from tools to different protocols to different processes uh, to different ways of collecting all of those, th those things. Um, so I feel like that this is something that everyone could benefit from knowing how other people are doing and uh, we chose to talk about it and uh, give it a try. Awesome. I know this is what you do in your day to day at the New York Times as well. So definitely interesting for you. Exactly. Um, John, what about you? Do you have any thoughts about choosing observability? Well, yeah, just, just uh, for, for everyone watching, the, um, like the started, Cheryl invited us to be, be part of this radar team. And it's not she, like she or anyone CS that came with us with a topic or an agenda or anything like that. We just started with a conversation about like, all right, what would be both interesting to us and would we think would be interesting to the larger community? Uh, we just bounced ideas uh, back and forth and tried a few things. And observability seemed like something like, like Marcin said, it is both universal, like you can't, um, 
you, uh, a company can't run and be successful without in some way observing the state of their servers, their users, and that sort of thing. It's, a, it's something that we all need to struggle with. And there's also been a lot of um, change and development. Like when I first started Zendesk about five years ago, the, there's a, you know, there were the set of tools available for do this, to, for us to do it is very different than what we have today. Um, so it's both a uh, important universal and sort of like a dynamic field that at least we've been experimenting a lot with. And I think it'd be interesting, at least interesting to compare notes with both the other people on the team and the larger community. Cool. I'll give it to Kunal next. Yeah, um, I think similar to what uh, Marcin and John has mentioned, um, you know, from, from my perspective, um, there's been an, uh, an kind of rapid increase in the cloud native space, a um, lot of adoption of the new tools, the new technologies and the new kind of paradigm in which um, developers are writing code and, and operating their code in. And, and a lot of them are choosing like a microservices based architecture. That's kind of what's become the norm. And in this kind of, uh, you know, massively distributed system, observability is really, really important. Uh, I mean, day in and day out, we, we rely on, on our observability for us to make sure we're serving all of our customers. And I'm sure everybody here also feels the same way. And so from that perspective, uh, you know, having a better understanding of what does the landscape look like for observability? Understanding what you know our peers in the end user community are using um, and finding helpful for their own needs is uh, very compelling for us to know, so that we can understand how to uh, you know how to chart our journey forward and what tools, technologies can we take advantage of. So this was very very relevant for us and very important. And we figured it's going to be the same for all the other end users as well as the new people coming into the cloud native space. So that's kind of one of the reasons from my perspective why this is a very interesting radar to choose. Cool, thank you, Kunal. Um, Jason? Yeah, I think the topic of observability made a lot of sense. It seemed both timely, um, I think this is something that uh, is top of mind in a lot of organizations. It seemed like there were a lot of um, projects, open source and, and closed, uh, um, so projects, standards, vendors, um, like software as a service type solutions. Um, so it seemed like we really could, you know, have, have a really meaty topic um, where we could dig into it and learn something. Cool. And yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Observability is, is one of the fundamental parts of cloud native. I don't think you can say you're doing cloud native if you don't have an observability solution somewhere in your stack. Um, so we actually went ahead and asked the end user companies what observability solutions they use. So just to give you a quick view of the kinds of companies that responded, um, you've got some logos you can look at here. Um, these are the companies sizes by the number of employees, the total number of employees. So you can see that there's probably maybe 50, 50, maybe slight bias towards the thousand employee plus. So mid to large size companies. And then the companies that were represented were across a range of different, different industries. Software is a bit, I'm not quite sure what that means, but you can see the rest is quite a, quite a widespread across different industries. Um, John, did you want to add anything Oops, before I move on? Oh, yeah, and just, just one note about the, as we start to get into the, um, some, some of the actual numbers here. Uh, so yeah, we canvassed 32 companies. We set out effectively like a survey or a spreadsheet. So we did not have like in-depth scientific interviews with like a super deep analysis here. So, uh, and there were a, a larger number of technologies that we kind of, the people that uh, companies brought up than are represented here. So you might be asking yourself, hey, why, you know, why isn't so-and-so here? Like the, the lack of something in here does not necessarily mean it's like, um, it's not used, we don't like it, but we needed to kind of winnow down to a, like an interesting and useful set of things to have opinions on. So this is by no means uh, 
attempting to be an exhaustive authoritative view of the entire, you know, 32 companies is not the entire industry. Um, but from the data we did see, we we're uh, highlighting a couple of interesting bits of information. Yeah, I think the, the more interesting analysis will come in six months or a year, 18 months, when we come back to, and do another radar on observability and we see how um, things change over time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for adding that, John. Um, you make a really good point that this is not supposed to be 100% objective. I don't even know if you can be 100% objective on this, but hopefully you can see at least from this roughly what kinds of companies and the size of companies that are represented. And this tech radar is really intended to be a guide for people as well. It's not supposed to say there is what exactly one technology stack that's going to be perfect for you. Instead, it's more like here are different things that these different companies are using. And if you're looking at a range of observability options right now, you could use this as more information to help you evaluate and prioritize what to evaluate. Okay, with that, I'm actually going to go into the numbers that we saw. So as I mentioned before, we're starting with assess. So the things where there were the least consensus. And so here are, we found there were three, com three projects slash tools in assess. And this bar chart represents the votes that people brought in. So the green is adopt, the bluey green is trial, and then yellow is assess. And then there's some gray for if they put it in hold as well. Uh, so John, maybe I can give you this to start with. Just any thoughts about these projects? Well, yeah, the f first thing I wanna point out is that um, the observant might notice that open telemetry is effectively a format Whereas Thanos and Kiali are like prod or, uh, you know, product software systems that you install and use. So it's, it points out another interesting bit about the observability space. There was like, you know, there are SaaS providers, there are open source uh, software you can run locally. There are um, like data formats and me methodologies. And we, we decided to kind of make it f a fairly broad, um, like, you know, asking companies like, what are you using and leaving it a fairly broad question just to see what people came up with. So you might notice there's some interesting like, okay, how do you compare open telemetry to Thanos? That's a bizarre thing. But again, this is more just like what people are interested in using. Um, so first of all, these are all like relatively new um, systems. Like, you know, Kiali, I think has maybe been around, around for a year, Th Thanos. So I think the, it shows that, um, you know, I, what, I, what I posit from, at least from our, our experience what I see, is that uh, like newer open source projects in particular have like interest in, in companies are in, like, you know, checking them out, interested in, but we didn't see a whole lot of pe people who would like, you know, put all their chips on that and like, you know, commit like this is a, a key part of our entire infrastructure. So I think, but these are seem like, seem like some promising technologies that have shown general interest in, in the groups and, you know, are worth uh, spiking on or take or at least following to see if they might be uh, worthwhile for your organization. Yeah, I agree. It's quite hard to compare, you know, one's a standard, one's an open source project. One is, you know, a project for a specific other projects. So it is challenging to compare. Okay. In that case, I'm going to move on to the set of projects that were placed into trial. So a few more in this case, we have Jaeger, Splunk, Lightstep, StatsD, CloudWatch, and Sentry. Um, Kunal, can I give this to you for thoughts? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, what you'll notice is there's a lot of tools here in the trial phase. Um, you know, what we noticed, uh, of course, was one thing uh, in there is that uh, some of these tools got a significant uh, number of contributions from the uh, votes that came in. And a big fraction of those were actually people who successfully went on to adopt them. Um, and so that, that's kind of what uh, helped uh, get these tools moved into um, into a phase where we feel they're more in like the trial phase with, with the end users who are using it. 
uh, some of these names are, uh, are pretty, uh, quite common and popular and most people know about these tools as well. So um, there's a good amount of tools here that people have experience with uh, using uh, successfully uh, for their observability needs. Yeah, and I think that we're seeing um, tracing as a, a little bit of a newer thing. And so you, you, you can really see that here um, with open telemetry, telemetry, Jaeger, Lightstep, um, things like that being um, a little bit more towards the bottom as organizations are starting to, um, you know, experiment with these tools and, and really get on board with them. Do any of your companies use any of these projects? Uh, we are big users of Thanos. I pay it. Yeah, we, we use, uh, so, so far, we use uh, Splunk, StatsD, CloudWatch, and a bit of Kiali. So we also use te technically open telemetry since it's a format. Yeah, we use a number of these tools as well that have been mentioned here. Yeah, I think you. If you're running on AWS, CloudWatch is something that you have to be familiar with, at least familiar with. And many, many organizations already sort of uh, assessed uh, what it can do and what, what it's capable of. Um, and CloudWatch and, th and StatsD are things that have been uh, available for a long, long time. So uh, people are also familiar with both of them. Yeah, you can also, you know, yeah, so we see some more, uh, more maturity in the, uh, in these as well. So apparently Cheryl has just lost her audio. So she's asked uh, one of us to say something. So as we can see, uh, ne next we can move on to the, let's see, can you advance a slide, Cheryl? Yes. Let's see. Oh, it's all gone. To, all gone to heck. Darn you, 2020. <laughs> Can we move on to the uh, adopt? Yes. Okay. So let me talk about it a little bit. Uh, so the adopt category is where we see uh, products and uh, technologies that are actually pretty well established. Uh, so things like Prometheus and Grafana and uh, Datadog, Elastic, Open Metrics, those all have been uh, present on the market and providing uh, tooling and uh, solutions for a long, long time. And they are already pretty mature. Like people, and people can use them and companies can use them and rely on them pretty uh, extensively. Um, so when we look up at those, they, those are the tools I think that solve the actually solve problems for people uh, in reasonably good ways. Um, and compared to the, the products and uh, things that we have in Assess and Trial, Trial and Assess seems to me like things that people have, are looking for solutions for uh, in many cases and are trying out those tools to check if they can actually solve those problems for them and are hoping to get those solutions to uh, solve those problems for them. And with Adopt, uh, we can rely on those things and make sure that, and we're pretty certain that they will be uh, reliable for people. Cool, um, awesome. Thank you. I think my audio is back. So um, I appreciate the summary that you just gave. I think that's a really good summary. Um, there were a lot more solutions that people gave answers for that were not listed here. So I think we had more than 30 in total. And I think it was, we had to sort of choose how many we could actually fit onto one radar just to not be overwhelming. Um, so Jason, I'm going to ask you, how did you find creating the radar? Did you find it easier or harder than you expected? Yeah, it, the, uh, the 
just kind of proliferation of tools and vendors and and projects in this space um, made it challenge. So just dovetailing right into what you just finished talking about. Um, I think we looked at that as a blessing, like, oh, there's a lot of tools that'll be really helpful. Um, but because there were so many tools, um, you know, that we know there were projects that, that um, CNCF end users are using, um, but, it, but we may be, didn't get any respondents that were using those um, tools. And so, you know, we can't make a, a judgment about, uh, about that, you know, a tool that uh, no one who responded is using, um, or if there was just very few respondents that were using it. So uh, it was both a blessing and a curse, um, unfortunately. And that was, the, I think, the hardest part. And I think it made it a lot harder than we were anticipating going into it. Actually, I'm going matching. Um, I think that what I found um, interesting about it is that we found like clear, let's call them winners, and things that are in between where they see clear adoption, but not across the board. Like with Prometheus and Grafana, it's pretty common everywhere or almost everywhere. But there are tools that have almost 100% of adoption, but on the smaller scale. And um, that was uh, sort of interesting to me to see that there are tools that solve problems really well, uh, se seemingly, but are not as popular or widely adopted as things like Prometheus or Grafana. And it was difficult for us to then, you know, judge where they should land on the on the radar uh, because uh, we didn't want to necessarily um, promote a tool let's let's call it promote that uh, is good but not widely adopted yet yeah, one, one of the experiences I had is that we you know we, we got information from the other end user communities but uh, in a lot of cases, it just ended up bringing up more questions for me. Like I wanted more, like there were several companies like Zendesk included that had like said that were adopting like multiple, arguably competing products or thing, you know, with Prometheus and Datadog and Splunk all kind of as, as tools we use. And I was wondering like, okay, are, um, you know, is that, is one of them a legacy that you're moving on to the new one? Are you, is it different? teams like is different groups in the organization it has a different use cases so it was this like wondering like what are all the the various stories and the in-depth thing and like the, the radar would kind of flatten everything into kind of a two-dimensional grid of like you know adopt trial so um like trying to uh like wondering about all the stories involved here and the reasoning for things um but still trying to like okay we need to converge on a a useful story instead of just like asking more and more questions. But it's really, really neat to see the, at least the, the feedback from the other people on the, on this team and the information we got about the other end user community companies. Yeah, I sort of came to this uh, evaluation with open mind uh, because we as an organization went through a pretty extensive process of evaluating what we actually want to do for the uh, future. Um, so we did uh, POCs with uh, open, uh, open source tools, uh, but uh, at the end we decided to go with a SaaS provider. And I was very curious about what other organizations do and how they do it and what kind of tools they adopting uh, for all those different use cases and data points that we now have to sort of uh, keep track of. And the number of tools uh, was sort of surprising to me, like the, how many tools there are that I was not uh, aware of, uh, of some of them. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thinking, Martin, as you were doing that evaluation, like what are the things that you thought are important about choosing an observability solution? Um, 
So first it was maturity of the products that we were evaluating or wanted to run. Uh, the second part was as an organization, do we want to invest in building our own ecosystem, observability ecosystem, or do we want to uh, hand it over to someone that is probably better than us at it, uh, even if we had to pay for it. Um, we decided that we'd rather focus on building our own or helping our own business rather than uh, learning all the things that other people already know and are experts at. Um, and that was essentially it. Yeah, one, one thing that Marcin just said that kind of tr triggered a thought in me is that like in the five years I've been at Zendesk, how, how we use observability tools have changed a lot. Like when I first joined, we had an ops team and they were responsible for production and they looked at graphs and, you know, dashboards, and that sort of thing. And they, they're the ones on call. But we've now uh, kind of morphed into an organization where like the, the, the product engineering or the, the teams that build the service monitor the service. So now like the entire engineering organization needs to interact with observability tools and gets, you know, they're like, you know, individual teams are the ones getting paged or alerted, need to look at their SLOs and that sort of thing. So that, um, you know, the, the scope of who needs to, like who this needs to work with uh, and in many cases the use cases has like changed dramatically. So our tooling has needed to evolve to match that. So I, again, we don't have concrete data from this, but I imagine a lot of the uh, companies in this group have kind of similar, similarly gone through like changes and evolutions over time regarding that. Yeah, it's, it's worth noting as well, this is a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. If we did this a year earlier or a year later, we would end up, up with something different. So it is worth noting this is, this data was collected last month, so August 2020, and really mm -hmm. reflects as it it, as people see observability right now. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the themes. So what things did you find interesting or noteworthy about what you saw? And the first one that the radar team came up with was the most commonly adopted tools are open source. And I thought when I saw this, like, well, duh, right? Of course, of course this is open source because everything is open source in this world, right? So, uh, John, maybe you can comment on why was this interesting? Oh, yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, like, yeah, like, like you said, it's, it's kind of unsurprising insofar as the, like, the end user group are a set of people who are, you know, most, almost all of us are running Kubernetes, either managed or open source. So we've all kind of bought into the idea of open source community supported, you know, cloud provider supported technologies. So it kind of makes sense we would use other ones as well. Um, but at least in, in our experience at, at Zendesk, at least the once you get to a certain scale of like of, of like data and company, it takes a lot of effort and time to actually run a lot of these open source tools at scale. And it's easy to spin up in a weekend following a blog post and that sort of thing. Um, so it's interesting to see that even at fairly large scales, a lot of these companies are investing the time and energy to run their own Prometheus clusters or Grafana or you know and like manage the complexity there. Um, and in many cases, rather than like, okay, using a, set, uh, a SaaS provider or paying someone to handle that stuff for it. Um, now to be fair, some of, the, some of the companies like Datadog and Splunk uh, are, you know, were in the upper, upper range of commonly used. So I think um, it's, while open source is most common, even amongst these 32 set of companies, there's a variety of approaches and financial trade-offs and work trade-offs that we've all taken. Ashton, do you have thoughts? Right. So the, it was actually very surprised to me that so many organizations are running those open source tools, like John said, uh, probably at a bigger scale, uh, because it's actually either opposite to what we did or how we evaluated our situation, or maybe those organizations didn't get yet to that point where they had an opportunity to evaluate what they actually want to do and they just 
go with a flow. Like they started with, I don't know, Prometheus and Grafana. And as they are growing, they expand and um, the deployment of those tools. Um, and that was very, very surprising to me uh, at the beginning where we got the, the results. Hi, at New York Times and same with you at Zendesk, you both use SaaS products yes. for observability, right? Yeah, I mean, more about us, we, we are a SaaS company, so we're all like, yeah, cool. you know, SaaS is a good idea. Everyone should do that. Um, but yeah, we, like, for a while, like logs, for example, for a while we had, we were running, uh, uh, for, you know, way back in the day, we just had a log server that people used grep for, and then eventually moved to a system where we were, like, uh, pushing logs to Kafka, and Kafka goes to an Elasticsearch cluster. But then we realized that, that that Elasticsearch cluster was getting bigger and bigger, and we realized, okay, we either need to hire several engineers just to keep that up and running and tuned and scaled and that sort of thing like that, and that's expensive. Or we should, you know, we should try to find a SaaS provider to handle logs for us. And we looked at the, you know, the cost of hiring people, the opportunity cost, the fact that, you know, we just figure a good SaaS provider would probably do a better job of managing logs than, you know, three and three or four or five engineers would do a, on our team. So we decided, okay, let's like take that money and give it to a provider. So we can use Datadog in, in this case. Um, but that was, you know, it was, a, it was a fair bit of like back and forth and uh, try, trying to determine the like, okay, do, do it in house versus like admit that's not our core competency and have someone else do it for us. The other problem that we ran into was that uh, we want engineering teams to be independent, but it came with a uh, with a cost of them deploying and maintaining their own uh, observability infrastructure, um, which again caused another problem where there was almost no transparency across the organization about how those systems perform or where those metrics are, where those logs are. And by adopting uh, the one of our goals first was to consolidate everything. Um, and with that, the next step was to use a SaaS provider to just give people tools and processes uh, to adopt uh, the platform. And it was easier than um, managing those, uh, the infrastructure for all those teams, uh, especially that they had different use cases, different requirements. It would be difficult for us to handle it all at the same time. Um, yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And the, the trade-off between in-house and having a SaaS provider is something that every company struggles with or has to make a decision on. Mm. So I'm going to go to the second theme or pattern, which was that there's no consolidation within the observability space. Kunal, your thoughts? Yeah, this one was actually very interesting from my perspective. Uh, um, you know, um, what we noticed was that uh, a large number of companies had actually uh, given opinions on a large number of the tools that have been uh, mentioned here, uh, which means that they have actually tried and have experience with at least many of these tools. Um, in fact, I think more than half of the companies uh, are using, uh, you know, five or more tools that have been mentioned here, which is a lot of tools for, uh, for observability. And so as the, you know, as the radar team was kind of looking at the data and trying to understand um, that, one of the things we um, realized was um, A, that, you know, the, the cloud native space is a very thriving community. Um, there's a lot of interesting innovation that's happening here. And so there's a lot of new tools that are coming in that are uh, looking to solve some of the problems as people uh, build more cloud native systems. And so as these new tools are coming in that are solving problems, people are looking at those tools to try and understand how to use them. So I think that's kind of what makes a lot of people at least have some experience with, uh, with these tools to be able to give some opinion on them. Uh, 
but I think the interesting thing the that we also noticed was that uh, a large number of these tools are actually being used on an ongoing basis. And part of the reason we think that's the case is because, um, you know, observability itself is a very kind of interesting art. Um, you know, I mean, you will often hear people talk about observability in the sense of logs and uh, metrics and tracing. So you're basically looking at a lot of data from a very a lot of different angles. And a lot of these tools uh, have their strengths in one or maybe a couple of those, but not necessarily all of the dimensions in which you're interested in understanding your data. And so that's probably a contributing factor to people having to choose more than one tool in order to understand all of the data that's coming in, in and to be able to make observable, dis observable deci decisions based on the data. And then finally, I think one thing that I think a couple of us uh, had uh, experience with uh, on the radar team that um, I think contributes to this fact as well is um, a lot of us are not uh, in the business of building observability tools themselves. Uh, in our core businesses are somewhere else. And so often once you make a choice for a tool um, and you invest heavily in adopting that tool, it becomes very hard to move into a different tool. Like the cost of investing to move completely from one system to another is pretty high. And often there isn't enough ROI to want to make that investment. And so um, that's kind of one of the contributing factors where once you adopt a tool, you tend to stay around with the tool, even though you might introduce another tool or give it a shot to see if it solves another problems, but may, you may not necessarily fully migrate off the old tool. Yes. And sometimes it can feel that, uh, you know, every month or every quarter, there's a new way to do things, a uh, new way to deploy your infrastructure or workloads. There is new uh, platforms to deploy to, uh, you know, we went from VMware, uh, for, from VMs to uh, containers to cloud functions. All those things require different ways to observe your workloads and your infrastructure and any and that comes with a cost of adopting yet another tool to do those things for you and yet another uh, uh, protocol or pattern and it's it feels like a natural thing to go because the technology progresses and it requires us to try and assess things constantly. And there is just more and more things showing up on the market. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why even kind of it ties together both the first and the second uh, theme you'll see here is the fact that when you choose an open source format, it actually makes it easier for you to experiment with other tools or move on to a different tool yeah. uh, from at least that perspective. Um, and so that's probably why uh, more and more people gravitate towards using open standards as opposed to uh, closed standards uh, when they're choosing their, their tools. Mm -hmm. Yes. So one of the things that we, uh, we did, even though we adopted a SaaS platform, we still uh, stayed with the open metrics for metrics. Uh, because we do want to have flexibility uh, to migrate somewhere else if we ever needed to, um, even if it comes with a higher cost of just running those systems. Yeah, no, I would say that in the consolidation, even um, like with my experience at Zendesk, there's a, it's a constant conversation going on here about the, the relative value and use case of different tools. Like metrics, for example, like StatsD style metrics don't give you a whole lot of granular detail of exactly what happened, but, you know, so logs give you a lot more information, but they're more expensive and, you know, to take, take more space and sort of thing. And then there's, uh, you know, pr uh, distributed tracing. So like what, you know, we kind of have like multiple ways of, mo of monitoring stuff, which is, or close to, but have their own, their own uh, quirks. So what are the, like, what's the relative value and is, what is most useful to teams, you know, trying to, uh, um, monitor systems to know if there are errors, to be able to troubleshoot things if an incident does occur. 
look at historical trends. So they all have these trade-offs. So we end up like running a couple of different tools in different, uh, both for different use cases. And I think we're still experimenting. Um, and you even see like, I think Slack came out with a blog post the other day about their, you know, a new, uh, their, their system, uh, what is it? Yeah, just tracing and Netflix has their egg drifting. So it's, it's, very, it's a constantly churning um, um, domain with lots of really interesting technologies kind of constantly popping up. Oh, and I see we have a comment from, I guess, one of the founders, maintainers of Open Metrics, who said that um, to, I think this was after Martin, like, that's in part why I started Open Metrics to force metrics into a label based system and then let the best one win. So he loves to see that it's being used and thought about as such. Which I think is a great comment. Yep. Thank you, Richard, for starting that. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on these first two themes? We have one more to discuss. Um, I also actually found this second one interesting compared to the first radar that I did where it was fewer projects and sort of more easy to choose where it was. I felt like this one had a lot more projects and it was much less clear which levels they should fall into. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was corrected that he's the founder. So I'm sorry, founder of Open Metrics. Okay, third theme, Prometheus and Grafana are frequently used together. Again, I thought, well, maybe this is obvious, but Martin, maybe you want to tell us why this is interesting. Um, like it is not surprising, but it is also surprising that so many organizations are deploying this essentially as a bundle. Um, and when we did run our own Prometheus with Grafana, uh, any, tutorial or any guide that you would, you know, Google uh, for answers, they both come uh, hand in hand. Like if, if you're deploying Prometheus, you are essentially going with Grafana. Uh, sometimes there is a mention of uh, Graphite, but those two are like a, a bundle that uh, come together. And even if you look at things like uh, hand charts or uh, different deployment patterns for those systems, they all are, they both are bundled. Um, and it may be that they just essentially work very well with each other and provide people with uh, what they are looking for. And because it's so widely adopted, it is now easy to deploy and maintain them uh, as a bundle, essentially. Jason, do you want to add to that? Um, no, I, I think it, it makes um, a ton of sense, but it was really striking. Um, you may not be able to see it in the radar on um, the way that the data is presented there, but in looking in the responses, um, it was almost 100% um, kind of overlap. So everyone that was using Prometheus was also using Grafana, uh, which was interesting. I don't think it was exactly 100, but it was close enough. It was very close, yes. Yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, I just want to point out that uh, I think it was NS, we've got like a thousand engineers, we have a foundation team, we've got a, like a vendor review board, but but at the end of the day, usually when we are, you know, trying something out or doing the proof of concept, there is some engine, like one engineer who is like Googling and reading blog posts to figure out, okay, how do I get this up and running on a test cluster or something like that? Um, so the, you know, the, the, the process that goes through initially is like the exact same as, you know, a hobbyist or a three person startup or something like that. So I think that like, all right, a couple of tools that fit together nicely and make it really easy to see value end to end um, you know, it, it, it's a lot easier to get to the point of like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to go tell my boss about this and, you know, have it work up the chain. So I think that uh, integrations like that are useful in the open source community, whatever possible. Kunal, if I remember correctly, you don't use Prometheus or Grafana, right? So 
Do you want to tell us why? Yeah. Um, so, so we got into the observability game, you know, right around the time when we were starting to get into the uh, Kubernetes side of the world as well. Um, and when we when we started on that journey, uh, Prometheus actually wasn't around. And so we made a bet on a different tool. We instrumented all of our systems, and you know, today we have millions of uh, metrics being emitted and. Uh, we have, you know, over 400 uh, engineers in the company who are completely trained on the tool and uh, understand how to use it. We have, you know, hundreds of dashboards, thousands of alerts set up. And so at this point in our journey, uh, kind of to the theme number two that you see there, it's really um, uh, kind of a lot of investment for us to um, move from our existing solution over to something like Prometheus or Grafana. And, and that's not just the cost for um, the, the like, redoing all the work, but it's also like, keep in mind, we have to train 400 engineers on the new tool. There's going to be a brief period in time where we're probably going to live in two worlds, in the existing world and in the new world. And like going through that whole transition just seems like a lot of work. Um, and we just don't see enough ROI in making that investment at this point. And again, it's not um, contributing towards our core business. It doesn't really buy us anything in terms of where our business wants to go. So that's kind of what's holding us back. If I were to start from scratch today, I'd probably go with uh, Prometheus and Grafana, which are like the popular choices and where end users are today. But given where we, we are and what the investment we've made so far is just a very hard sell to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And someone in the comments also said that we as Prometheus team deprecated Prom Dash in the favor of Grafana in 2015 or 2016 as the officially recommended dashboarding tool. So I guess that was somewhat earlier on. And yeah, much harder to switch once you've built a few years of investment and tooling around it, around one project. So putting that all together, this is basically what the, the final radar looks like. So in, a, in ADOPT, we have these five projects, Prometheus, Grafana, Elastic, Datadog, Openmetrics. In trial, we have uh, six here and then three in Assess. And I'm gonna ask each of our panelists just one thought or takeaway or something that you learned from going through this exercise. Uh, so, John, can I start with you? Um, I, th I think it was uh, it, it, it was nice and somewhat validating to discover like so many um, so many companies use so many tools and are still like it's not it's not just us that has three or four different observability tools running at the same time and we're all uh, you know like sure sharing thoughts and ideas with the other people on the team, like, oh yeah, this is something that we all struggle with. And I think the value of um, talking to your peers and getting, um, you know, either, either to get their like advice, commiserate, or just like you know, have someone who has an opinion on this that isn't really biased and trying to sell you some, one thing one way or the other is really valuable to me. Jason, let's get next. Yeah. Um, this was a really, really fun um, process, and um, it really wouldn't have been possible without, you know, Cheryl and Julie's um, coordination. So big thanks, um, mad props to them um, for that. But I think my thoughts on the, the kind of the radar and the process and whatnot is um, that, yeah, I, again, I want to reiterate that there were a lot of, there are, are a lot of tools and um, unfortunately, because of kind of the subset of data that we have, you know, we can't make judgments about um, tools that, you know, that subset of, of CNCF end users um, didn't use widely. Um, so we know that there are a lot of good tools that kind of didn't make the cut because they didn't have uh, the votes and we couldn't make a judgment about them. So um, that's not a reflection of the quality of the projects that aren't, or the tools that aren't on here. Yep, definitely. So after the last one, a few people asked me, how do I get my tool onto this? And I was like, you can't just add it if the data's not there, right? Like, 
is it comes from these companies that we've spoken to. Um, Martin, thoughts, mm -hmm. takeaways? So I really, uh, <clears throat> sorry, really enjoyed the process uh, and the collaboration. And I'm happy to that I was able to learn how other organizations do things. Um, and as for the radar, I, I, I read it as there are things that do solve problems really well. There are things that solve problems well for some people. And there are tools or uh, things that people hope to be solved uh, for them in the future. Like when I think about open telemetry, it's something that we are excited about and waiting for. Uh, when I think about Thanos, when we did a POC with Thanos, we were really hoping for it to solve the storage problem for the, the metrics data for us. Um, and you know, as those things mature and get uh, better, uh, they have a chance to solve those problems really, really well. Uh, and people are anticipating them. Awesome. Um, I'm glad that you enjoyed the process. And Canal, last word to you. Um, yeah, so I, I will echo uh, what the other panelists have said and, and thank Cheryl and Julie and the entire CNCF team to, uh, you know, help uh, shepherd this whole thing. I think this is a very valuable effort. I also want to uh, thank all the fellow panelists. I think it's been a lot of fun uh, having these conversations and learning what everybody thinks about uh, what's happening and, and kind of trying to come up with some way to wrangle all of this data together to present in some meaningful way. Um, I'm super excited actually to see the large number of tools and uh, the various kinds of problems they solve here and how end users are using this. Um, I think it ref for me, it reflects really some of the challenges in running a distributed system uh, in a cloud native way. I'm super happy to see the amount of interest and investment that's happening in the industry that's leading to uh, you know, newer and newer tools coming up that are looking to solve some of the problems that um, you know, we as end users are facing in trying to build this kind of an architecture. So uh, for me, like a big takeaway is um, that this observability landscape is pretty large. Um, lots of people looking to solve interesting problems here. So uh, uh, I would encourage both the um, uh, people who are uh, building and creating these tools to continue all the hard work that they're doing and then the end users to uh, share all of their feedback with CNCF and these end uh, and the creators of these tools so that they can continue to iterate and um, make these tools better so that we as end users can benefit from that. That's a, that's a great summary. And also I want to say thank you to all of you for working with me on this. Um, I've actually enjoyed the process a lot as well and learned a lot from all of you. Um, so last thing to mention, we have a new website, radar.cncf.io, where you can go and see all of the information that we've just run through today. You can find the previous radars as well. Uh, if you want to get involved, uh, I'd love to hear what do you think the next topic, the next radar should be on? You can go to cncf.io slash tech radar. This is a GitHub issue where you can just vote on things that you think the next radar should talk about. If you want to come and contribute towards future radars, then please come and join the CNCF end user community where you can hang out with fantastic people like these people. Um, obviously, this is only for end users, so vendors are not allowed to join, but we would love to have you in the community. And lastly, if you just have general thoughts or feedback about how we can make this radar more interesting, more valuable to you, what else could we do? Then just email info at cncf.io. We are pretty much out of time, so I'm sorry for uh, not being able to have time for questions. But again, just put it, you can put stuff on this GitHub issue and I will go and check it out and answer afterwards. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody's time uh, chatting today. And just the last things to wrap up. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our presenters for coming and joining today. 
and the webinar recording and slides will be posted online later today. We look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks, you all. Thank you.